Hello, everybody. This is Christopher Phillips, founder, executive director of Democracy Cafe. Our nonprofit is dedicated through flagship initiatives like Socrates and Cafe, Socrates Cafe and Democracy Cafe to making ours truly a more connected and egalitarian world in which everybody matters and counts. And my guest today is our beloved honorary board member, Brother Cornell West. And Brother West, truly, you fit my conception of what a Aratista is. I, I've never met anyone, honestly, who has lived a life of all around excellence like you. And you and you frankly, every time I, I listen to you or read something that you've done, you you radicalize me again in the best sense of the term. Well, let me just say this, my brother, that uh being your friend and being your intellectual and spiritual comrade is one of the great joys of my life. And when I think of what Arate is all about. You know, it kind of makes you tremble and quiver in a certain sense. And yet at the same time, uh, you rec we all recall Samuel Becker's great words from Worse Where Ho, his last piece of friction, where he talks about try again, fail again, fail better. Try again, mm -hmm. fail again, fail better. And that's the story of our lives, that we, we fail and bounce back based on the memory of those great examples of figures and movements and institutions that serve as wind at our back as we try to bear witness before the worms get our bodies, my brother. Mm. Well, who was, looking as far back, who was the first one to really radicalize you? Did you go, like, like, so, like who was your A. Philip Randolph or somebody like that? Mm. Well, in some ways, it was Reverend Willie P. Cook, the Shiloh Baptist Church on the chocolate side of Sacramento. Uh, he exemplified for me a depth of spirituality, hypersensitivity to the suffering of others, took the life of the mind very seriously. My grandfather, actually, Reverend C.L. West, was also a great uh, exemplar of that kind of arate. In terms of uh, 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 my reading, it was Kierkegaard. We didn't have access for the most part to these mainstream libraries, but we had bookmobiles way out. On, on outside of Sacramento in the ghetto where I grew up in Glen Elder. So you were uh, reading I, Kierkegaard? Read Kierkegaard? Yeah, at 14, man. I read Kierkegaard 14 from the book movie. He blew my mind, man. Wow. He blew my mind, my brother. Whew, wow. Oh, my goodness. But it was Martin King, I think, who really brought all of that together because I, I never knew Martin. I heard I went to hear him speak one time when I was 10 years old at Memorial Auditorium in Sacramento and mom and dad took my brother and I. Uh, but what, but Martin really brought together the love of neighbor, the love of justice, the love of wisdom, the love of beauty, and the love of God. And is that kind of a, a multi-dimensional love that uh, has always set at the center of my own aspirations, even as I've, again, fallen far, far, far short. You know, he he truly was a radical, and your beautifully curated, uh, edited, uh, The Radical King, conveys that so eloquently. I mean, you know, the FBI was painting him as a radical. Well, he really was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, J. Edgar Hoover said he's the most dangerous man in America. What he's dangerous in terms of his resistance and critique of an unjust status quo that was rooted in militarism, was rooted in a predatory capitalism that didn't keep track of the precious humanity of working and poor people of all colors, rooted in a white supremacy that lose contact with the humanity of mm. indigenous peoples and mm. black peoples and brown peoples and mm. yellow peoples and similarly so with the male supremacy. Mm. Martin was a love warrior at the deepest level. I mean, he was the incarnation of John Coltrane, the love supreme. Mm. You know, it's hard to fathom these days, but his notions of love back then were considered of unconditional love, were considered so radical, it was hard just to get ordinary people to to support his views. He was he was somebody even among those who he was trying to fight on their behalf that they had trouble with some of his ideas. Oh, oh absolutely. Because as we know, my brother, when you're actually trying to speak truth to power, and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak, 
you also must speak truth to the relatively powerless mm. because they themselves are captive to mm. a certain kinds of blindness, a certain kinds of myopia and short-sightedness. Mm. So they have to undergo the same paideia, that same mm. deep education, that formation of attention, that cultivation of a critical consciousness, that maturation of a compassionate soul. Right. It's a human thing. And no matter where you are, no matter what color, class, and so forth, it's still a challenge. It's just that we have to keep track of these structures of domination mm. that are doing people in. Absolutely. Mm. But his was a notion of radical inclusion and unconditional love that to this day is as bracing and fresh and hard to achieve as ever. Oh, it will always be so, my brother. It will always be so that... Um, Thank God, on the one hand, as my brother Clifton says, love never goes out of style. Mm. But at the same time, love is always a uh, fundamental threat. It's a challenge because it unsettles us. Mm. Uh, it, it, it unnerves us. And um, just to, to, to philosophize is to learn how to die, as Montaigne mm. says, which means that we have to radically attempt to call into question and mm -hmm. in some way kill that fear, that selfishness, mm -hmm. that narcissism, mm -hmm. that, that, that tendency toward uh, uh, envy, the tendency, tendency toward contempt. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you undergo that process of learning how to die, you're learning how to live because mm -hmm. you are being reborn. In the place of the fear comes the courage. So you, mm -hmm. the courage works through the fear. In the place of the hatred mm -hmm. comes deeper love. In the face of the injustice become, comes deeper conceptions of justice. So that this process, learning how to die in order to learn how to live. Remember the eulogy for Brother Martin King that our dear sister Dorothy Day, one of the great prophetic figures mm -hmm. of our time, mm -hmm. in her eulogy, she said, Martin Luther King Jr. learned how to die daily. He did. And he even was he almost, how to die daily. he was almost prophetic about it in his very final talk yeah. the night before he was killed. I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Oh, that's true. But the FBI had been on him for so long. And, uh, and as you know, at the end of his life, he was so lonely. He mm. was so utterly uh, isolated. The young folk were calling him an Uncle Tom because it looked as if he wasn't militant enough. The churches that turned their pulpits against him because of his critique of U.S. imperial uh, criminality in the Vietnam War, dropping bombs on innocent people. Uh, the mainstream, New York Times, Washington Post, and others were saying, oh, you're just the voice of communist Hanoi in your criticism of U.S. policy. You're a civil rights activist. You should say nothing about foreign policy. Uh, uh, his own organization I told him that it, it was uh, it was folly to try to bring all poor people together. So we had to stay in the black community rather than engage in a critique of capitalism, a critique of wealth inequality, the kind of thing that Brother Bernie Sanders mm. uh, has been talking about for so many years on this larger national yes. stage. So Martin King was very much pushed to the margins. You know, he right. used to say over and over again, he says, it's just so sad that nobody really understands me but at the same time i would rather be dead than afraid mm -hmm. i'm moving forward mm -hmm. i'm moving forward and i think one of the greatest moments in martin's life was when he emerged from a paddy wagon on his way to reedfield prison in Totnaw, georgia mm -hmm. And uh, he was had been in that paddy wagon for four and a half hours in the dark, my brother, with a German shepherd. And I'll never forget, Andy Young told me this. He said, Andy said, me and, and Martin's father, Martin Luther King Jr. Sr., were the only two people there. When, when he emerged out of that paddy wagon, brother, that police wagon, he could hardly walk. Mm -hmm. And he was saying over and over again, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. And it, it, it's the centrality of that cross signifies unconditional love and justice is what love looks like in public. Mm -hmm. That cross signifies unarmed truth. 
Mm-hmm. And that condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak and to be sensitive to the suffering of others. His, his very, very close friend at the very end of his life was Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Mm-hmm. And, Re- and, Re- and the great Rabbi Heschel, of course, had talked about the prophetic coming yes. out of the legacy of Judaism, of Amos, of Esther, of Jeremiah, of Isaiah. And remember now, and, and I don't need to remind you, you know, Socrates, as great as he was, and, and, and let us always view him as a brook of fire through which all of us must pass, but he never sheds a tear. Mm-hmm. He never cries. Whereas Jesus weeps like Jeremiah, mm-hmm. and and those tears make the difference. You see, those 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 tears. I mean, that's the very title of uh, of, of 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 the of the book of Lamentations in mm-hmm. Hebrew scripture. When the Greeks translated, it was tears. You know, uh, the how the tears and those tears open us up. They crack open our hearts. That, was that wonderful formulation that we get in Shakespeare who comes directly out of both Socratic legacies of Athens and prophetic legacies of Jerusalem, that brokenhearted. If you get the same thing in James Ball was no name in the street. America, you broke my heart. Mm. Mm. You broke my heart. And you remember now, my brother, that a, uh, anytime you have a saint, you never have a pure and pristine human being. They're always fallen. But Mm -hmm. a saint is a sinner who looks at the world through the lens of the heart. Mm -hmm. So all of the great saints have a broken heart. Teresa, St. Francis, Martin King, John Coltrane. We can go on and on and on. They have a broken heart because the world is in the heartbreaking business. That's the kind of world mm-hmm. we live in. That's why we're in the world, but not of the world. Because mm-hmm. if you're fully of the world and the world is not breaking your heart, mm-hmm. something's wrong with your sensitivity. Mm-hmm. You travel all around the world. Yes. I can imagine the tears flowing at the end of each day, even as the joy is inseparable from those tears, from your rich interactions with the people in Mexico. And you send me these different magnificent uh, communications my brother you know i'm always praying for you always praying for you. oh indeed indeed my brother but so so that you can see how the tears and the joy yes. are inseparable the socratic yes. questioning and the sensitivity to others and prophetic with wit, wit, a witness go hand in hand and i think that's what martin luther king represents and keep in mind though one last point Mm-hmm. Is that Brother Martin is just a wave in an ocean, brother. He's not an isolated icon. Right. He comes out of a tradition of a black people who have been hated for 400 years, but keep dishing out love wars. Well, you know, I have a glass encased poster with uh, something he said to David Halberstam in 1967. Martin Luther King said, for years I labored with the idea of reforming the existing institutions of society. A little change here, a little change there. But now I feel quite differently. I think you've got to have a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values. Wow. That's true. That's Martin. He's revolutionary. He is. He was a, a spiritual radical and a revolutionary at, at the level of Arate. And Arate always mm-hmm. has a moral and spiritual dimension mm-hmm. to it. A lot of times when people talk about revolution these days, the, the, the image becomes that of some urban guerrilla, you know? Yes. Well, you know, I was brought up in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Both of my parents were raised in housing projects in Virginia. Uh, my, dad's wow. fam- my dad's family came dirt poor from Greece. My mom was born in a coal mining camp in Appalachia. And so then we moved to the greater D.C. area. And my dad, he had a lisp, a severe lisp his whole life because he was teased so mercilessly about his thick Greek accent. He knew racism firsthand. And he took me to the resurrection camp, the People's Campaign, after Martin Luther King's oh, death. Yes, he wanted yes. me to bear witness. It was, people of, it was poor people of all colors, Latinos. Uh, That's right. And he, That's he didn't right. say a word to me. He just took me there because he wanted me to see it. And I mean, I, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. It, 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 you know, ever since that day, I was 12 years old. I began um, doing volunteer work year-round for UNICEF. 
uh, I, the, I got special permission at school to, to have a, a fundraiser there at, at school at lunchtime. But it was really witnessing that, that Resurrection City. It had almost 3,000 people. And I would, uh, this one woman, she had four children in tow. She was a single mom. And she just gave me one of her babies one time. She just said, will you hold my baby for a minute? And she had to breastfeed wow. her other baby. And she just handed it to me. <laughs> and, and that was my radicalization right there in that in that oh, resurrection okay. city. Well, see, the beautiful thing is that you were able to immerse yourself into the rich humanity of poor brothers and sisters of all colors. And it's that kind of humanization and radicalization that go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Because it's not and like Martin Luther stuff. King came from a poor family. There was a pretty middle class family, but he had a heart of gold. He felt people's pain. That's exactly right. That he had been shaped and molded. His soul had been nurtured in such a way there at, at Ebenezer Baptist Church, where his father was the minister, under the great Benjamin Mays, who was the president of Morehouse. Mm. Uh, and, and then his teachers, Beaufort Crozier, Theological Seminary and Boston University. And he studied right here where I'm talking to you mm. at Harvard, took a number of courses in Emerson Hall at Harvard. But all of these went into the shaping of his soul such that he became someone who was willing to be faithful in life and faithful unto death. And you should mm. keep in mind, I, I mentioned this in my book, you know, in his essay, The Bravest Man I Ever Met. Mm was Norman Thomas, the great democratic socialist who mm -hmm. ran against FDR four times in a row. But Martin, when he was called in regard to his winning the, uh, the Nobel Prize, and he said, no, I don't want the prize. Give it to Norman Thomas. He's so much greater mm -hmm. than I am. That's, that's serious business. And Norman that's, Thomas is hardly known, as you That's know. exactly He's, right. But he, he comes out of Eugene Debs, Michael Harrington, Incredible. A. Philip Randolph, uh, Bayard Rustin, Democratic Socialist tradition, much older than Martin. He was a Christian minister. He went to uh, Princeton undergrad, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, went to Union Theological Seminary, graduated again near the top of his class. But he lost his religious faith in East Harlem mm. as he worked with poor black and brown people. And he, of course, was a vanilla brother. He was a white brother yes. from the Midwest. And for the rest of his life, as he lost his religious faith, he became more intensely committed to the struggle for justice. Yes. And he died. He died very mm -hmm. old, but never, ever sold out. You know, we live in the age of the sellout, brother. Mm -hmm. People sell their souls for a mess of pottage every day. You have that every in your book. Mission, with academicians, lawyers, pharmacists, right. doctors. This is this is a highly commodified world, yes. especially the United States, the American Empire is thoroughly commodified. And so Martin never sold out. Well Norman Thomas yes. never sold out. Never did. And that's never why did. I think I'm struggling right now, Brother West. There's so many. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. I I have to ask myself, do I really want some return of the vintage Obama, Biden, Hillary Clinton triumvirate, or would I rather just deal with a straight out gangster? I mean, really, if we're not going to have universal yeah. basic income out of Biden. He thumbs his nose at universal health care. And I, I'm, yeah. str I'm struggling with that choice. I think Martin Luther King would say in 2020, if these are the best choices we have, we should take to the streets. Oh, there's no doubt we got to take to the street. We got to take to the street. We've got to organize. We've got to sustain social motion and movement and we got to be willing to go to jail and some of us have to be willing uh, to die hmm. but at the same time we've got to be part of an anti-fascist coalition because we've got neo-fascist and fascist forces on the move we already got a gangster who was has, has, was, was neo-fascist uh, uh, sensibilities in the white house and so if the choice is between neo-fascism which is catastrophic and milk toast neoliberalism, which is a disaster, mm. that it's still better to have the disaster and then hit the streets. It's better to have the disaster and okay. then put tremendous pressure to bear okay. on the militarism of Biden, as we saw the militarism of Clinton and the militarism of Obama, no right. doubt. No the doubt. Wall Street alliances and friendly connections 
that we got with Biden, with Obama, with Clinton, is neoliberal. It, it's still captive to a, uh, 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 a Wall Street and a militarism. Mm-hmm. I mean, one way of looking at it is, is that uh, you've got Trump and company who are the neo-fascist wing of the ruling class, and then you've got Biden and Obama and Clinton and company who are the neoliberal wing of mm-hmm. the ruling class, and yet Martin Luther King Jr. was critical of the whole system yes. that produces ruling classes with very little accountability to working and poor people. Yes. Well, that's why I'm glad you said that, because the thing that I've been wrestling with, I have dialogues all the time with dislocated people, especially indigenous mm. people kicked out of their communities and oh, with, with, with people Lord, from Lord. Central America, people from Honduras in particular. You know, when Hillary Clinton was secretary of state, she she looked the other way while there was a military coup of a democratically Excellent. elected government that was going to reshape the Constitution to make it more democratic. So now there's countless, countless millions of people dislocated from those policies who to this day are becoming ever more invisible and coronavirus just contributes to that. And so I I struggle with that. I struggle with supporting anybody who was part of that. No, I I, I agree. I mean, that's why, I mean, a a particular vote is not an endorsement. Mm. Uh, when I was behind Bernie, it was endorsement because right. I was I could I could throw so much of myself in his campaign. I still mm-hmm. had my critique, but mm-hmm. but I could throw so much of myself in in his campaign. He was my brother. He's got integrity, but with neoliberals of any sort, it could be Obama or, or Biden or Pelosi. These folk are still tied to Wall Street and empire. And when you're looking at the United States, as our precious brothers and sisters are from Honduras. Mm-hmm. You know, they remember all the times that the United States intervened in Central America, intervened in Latin America, intervened in West, the West Indies and the Caribbean, intervened in Iran and so forth. Mm-hmm. 211 times the United States used armed forces in 67 countries since 1945. Incredible. So the United States is an empire. Yet... And you know the wonderful book by Brother Daniel Emmerwar, How to Hide an Empire. Most Americans in the United States don't even understand that they're living in an empire. Hmm. They don't understand the, the ways in which the interventions that of a military sort or of a uh, corporate sort are, have been operating over the last 150 years. I mean, the whole nation, really, from the expansion of 13 states to 50 states was imperial expansion vis-a-vis indigenous peoples. Mm. And then Guam and the Philippines and Cuba and Puerto Rico in the 1890s. And then after 1945, the United States occupied Korea, Japan, Germany. It gave up the territories in certain places, but then also had military presences and had strong corporate interests Mm. and use its military to intervene when democratically elected leaders in the name of poor people wanted to gain access over their resources. That's right. Like Arbites in Guatemala. And there are repercussions so to this I, I day. Understand, I understand my, my brothers and sisters in Honduras. We did march when the Clinton mm-hmm. uh, uh, Secretary of State turned her, her back and, 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 and accepted the... Uh, 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 the militaristic uh, rule and the coup. It really was a coup. It was a coup. And, 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 and accepted the, the coup. And, and she did the God same thing in Haiti. Donald, Haiti, Dominican Republic in 65, Goulart in Brazil in 64. There's a long, long history. Yeah. Grenada, Panama. We can go on yes, and on sure. and on. Absolutely. So the, 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 the empire, United States as empire, it's something that is just now really surfacing. I mean, I thank God for the work of Glenn, Glenn Ford and uh, uh, um, Ajamu Baraka, Margaret Kimberly of the Black Agenda Report and the Black mm. Alliance for Peace. And right now, uh, you know, there, there, there's a trial. Uh, there, we're waiting for the conviction of some brothers and sisters up in uh, Kings Bay. Mm. Who, who like Daniel Berrigan, uh, engaged in civil disobedience. They're, mm-hmm. they're being sent to jail for two, two months. One of them is Sister Martha uh, Hennessy, who was the granddaughter of the great Dorothy Day. 
Uh, uh, these are the folk who are bearing witness in the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. in these very grim and very bleak days that we find ourselves, my brother. And I salute you mm. for your magnificent courage and energy and vitality in trying to keep alive serious Socratic reflection and prophetic witness with folk in every corner of the globe who are undergoing suffering that suffering that wretched of the earth that the great Franz Fanon talked about. Well, lastly, Brother West, I want to ask you, what do you do, changing course for me, what do you do to blow off steam? Do you go and listen to music? What, what do you do to just relax and, and be in the moment for a little bit? Well, I tell you, my brother, I, uh, you know, I'm on lockdown now, so that... Uh, you must be I listening to some read. good jazz and reading some books. Uh, yeah, yeah. Other than the reading, you know, eight or nine hours, I uh, uh, just 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 yesterday I listened to Brahms's uh, second piano concerto, which is so so powerful. I listened to Dorothy Love Coates, the great gospel singer, mm. called uh, "Holding On." I'm just holding on to my faith. That nine minute live performance with she and the original harmonettes. Woo! Mm. I recommend that to everybody. <laughs> That is beautiful. always Curtis Mayfield. Always Curtis Mayfield and, and John Coltrane. Listen to John Coltrane's spiritual. Yes. A magnificent performance in November 1961. Just called spiritual. Let it let it seep in your soul. Well, that's what I'm going to listen to. Oh, yes. As as but we... don't forget about Curtis now. Don't forget I about won't. Curtis Mayfield now. Oh, you listen to yeah. the, 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 uh, Keep on pushing. Keep no. on pushing. I've been trying. No, you've you've in, you've influenced my musical taste at more than anybody on this planet. I'll have you know. <laughs> that's right. it's true. It's Ooh, so true. That, oh, you're well, so kind. I, yeah. How's your how's your family doing, man? They are good. Uh, it's been over a month now that they've all been in the same house. Luckily, we have a tiny front yard, and my girl's passion is this thing called aerial silks. So I, ah. I built for them a little aerial silk studio in the front yard. Um, I just, I, and they are in heaven. It's liberating ah. for them. I'll, I'll send you a photo of it on WhatsApp yeah, after we hang out. Send me a picture yeah. though, brother. You know, I oh. love your pictures, man. Oh. Can I, just, I love your pictures. Can I just thank you so much for just being, you know, allowing me to be in your life and for just everything that you've shared. It, it's made just an endless world of difference. Well, I tell you, though, brother, as I said at the very beginning, that uh, you are one of the special ones of mind, spirit, and deed that bless me in my brief life. And uh, I just look forward to seeing you again so I can give you a hug. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, meantime, I'm sending you a virtual hug and lots and lots of love for me, Ceci, sibling Cal. Oh, same here, my brother. Indeed. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Long live Martin. Long yes. live love. Long live justice. Long live Arate. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, my brother. Bye-bye.